Welcome to New Hampshire's Wild Side. I'm Christina Lupi. And I'm Mark Beauchene. We'll take you behind the scenes of the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department to learn more about the people and projects of your Fish and Wildlife Agency. We'll also give you tips and tactics that you can use to make the most out of your time in New Hampshire's woods and waters. And along the way, we'll meet real people who love life outdoors. Now, let's discover more about New Hampshire's Wild Side. I was a big fan of that. Got a good bat backdrop of all the foliage today. So here we are, we're at Butterfield Pond here in Wilmot, right on the edge of the Guile State Forest. And uh, this is one of the t remote uh, ponds for fishing game filled with brook trout. Uh, and this is fall fishing. And so it's a little bit different because the brook trout at this point in the season are starting to spawn. And so we're gonna be looking for some gravel beds that we might find some fish uh, around those areas. Typically, they're very aggressive at this point in time. With pond fishing, it's not like fishing a stream. The, the fish cruise all over the pond. So the presentation's a little bit different um, to these fish. In the summer in a pond like this, you'd, you'd wanna locate the spring and fish the spring area. At this point, the water's pretty cold. I didn't take the temperature, but it all bodes well for fall fishing. Oh, well, Chuck's got one. I just went to the, uh, that blood red golden retriever I was telling you about. The old adage, Dark fly, dark day, bright fly, bright day. And I'm fishing something that, I'm fishing a taboo caddis emerger. I'm using a, a feather from a hewing hen. When I learned to tie flies when I was growing up, I probably was in full fourth or fifth grade. I don't think I've ever bought any unless it was a collector fly. There was a box of fly tying equipment and um, I started fooling around with it and I think there was some directions with it and probably didn't read the directions very well, but uh, I was able to tie a couple flies and then from there it took off. Sure is a pretty time of year to be on the water, though. There he is. <laughs> That's a feisty little bunch. This is a little male, too. <laughs> Float tube fishing is kind of a uh, kind of a hidden jewel. It's an underutilized uh, way of fishing. A lot of people are intimidated by it, but you know, waders, wading boots. The tube and some fins and a good PFD and you're good to go. Use the hashtag better outside when you share photos and videos showing how you connect with life outdoors and don't forget to tag New Hampshire Fish and Game on Facebook and Instagram.
Well, when I first started, I uh, contacted a bunch of museums and living history places, you know, see if I could get involved in blacksmithing somehow. And just blacksmithing, not so much bladesmithing, there's a difference there, just general blacksmithing, hooks and nails and stuff, but just to get a feel for the whole process. I finally got in touch with the Hancock Shaker Village and they put me in touch with another blacksmith. And he is an extremely nice guy. You know, he let me come over his house, do a few lessons there, and then he talked with the village and then, you know, we figured out an arrangement here where I can come up to the village, work with him, you know, learn general blacksmithing things from him. And at the same time, I'm kind of teaching him knife making stuff. The heart of the blacksmith shop is the forge here. And we burn bituminous coal in here. So you put the coal on the outside of the fire and let it burn on the outside until it turns into coke and then you bring it into the center of the fire and that's what you heat your steel in. Part of the reason why I started making knives, I needed a good hunting knife and didn't have one so I'm like, I'll give it a try and make one. And the first knife I made was actually just a chunk of steel that I found out in the woods. And I shaped it with a bunch of files, did a really crude heat treatment on it, and I had a working knife. Anyone can be a knife maker. All you need is a file and a piece of steel. But it's not, it's not the whole process. It's not the way things were done. And you don't get as fine of a product in the end. When you're actually bladesmithing, you're starting out with just a square chunk of steel and then hammering it to shape there. It's a much more involved process. There's a, a narrow band that you can work your steel at. Outside that, you're either gonna grow the grain too much because it's too hot, or it's just gonna break on you because it's too cold and too hard when you hit it with a hammer. Heat is crucial to steel. It affects the grain structure tremendously, which in turn makes a stronger knife if you do it properly. Or you can end up breaking it in half, which you know, happens quite frequently when you're starting out. There's so many variables in knife making, and especially bladesmithing because of all the work in the forge, that you can screw up at any point. I know I've certainly had my fair share of knives just snap in half, just from, you know, getting the temperatures wrong, and hours of work down the drain in 30 seconds. I'd say 90% of my knives start out as a drawing on a piece of paper. And then based on that, I forge a knife out. Now whether it is exactly like on paper is another story. I mean, sometimes it'll be bigger or smaller, it just depends on how I feel. On a few occasions, like I'll have a person come up to me with a design that they want and you know, basically talk me through how they're gonna use it and that really helps me tailor the knife to what they're going to be needing. Well, after they come out of the forge, they have to be rough ground, heat treated, then final grinding, and a handle. And then you finish it off with a sheath to put it in.
you're starting out with just a square chunk of steel beaten into shape. It has to be worked in the fire. That's what a bladesmith is. With over 975 lakes and ponds to play on, it's better outside because we're here connecting you to life outdoors. Now watch this. Hi, I'm Denny Corvo, New England's Wild Chef. Joining me in the kitchen today is my daughter Kaylee. We're going to make for you a venison pho. So to start with our pho, we're going to take a venison loin, lay it down, and slice it very thin. I'm going to add these pieces to our bowl. And it's amazing. I mean, look at the beauty of this protein. Totally preservative free. We're always looking for unique ways to do things with our game meat and loin is a great piece of meat to work with. It's very lean and delicious and tender. So now we have all our loin sliced up. So Kaylee, what are we gonna do with this loin? I'm gonna season it with your blood orange olive oil and your ginger citrus seasoning. Mmm, that sounds tasty. So how do you do that? I'm gonna take your blood orange olive oil and okay. drizzle it over the meat. I'm going to take the ginger citrus seasoning and sprinkle it over it. Mm. Ginger citrus sounds like it has a nice Asian theme to it. Okay, so now that you have this seasoning in there, what are you going to do? Now I'm going to mix it all together so all the flavors come together. Yum. Great job. Hey, let's add just a tiny bit more of that. Yes. That's really going to make it special, huh? That looks great, Kaylee. Now let's go move on to our broth. Okay. So to make our broth, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some condensed bouillon. And all that's gonna do is intensify the flavor of our beef stock. Super. We're gonna turn our broth up. We're gonna whisk a little bit of that in. And now, Kaylee, if you could add some wild onion blend. How about two of those? And some roasted garlic. Mmm. And how about if you squeeze some fresh ginger in? So come right over and put that in. A little more, a little more, a little more. Great. Okay. And some lemongrass. Fantastic. And so what we're doing is we're melding all these flavors together to make this Asian broth. Now typically in a traditional venison pho, you certainly could use things like star anise, Chinese five spice, and things of that sort. But I think the ginger, the garlic, the lemongrass, all these things put together make for really flavorful broth for the pho. And all you're looking to do is to take that broth, heat it up, and get it to where it's boiling for maybe about four or five minutes. And then you're gonna see a technique that we're gonna use with this boiling broth to put the finishing touch on our pho. Our Asian broth is done. Let's go plate our pho. To finish our pho, we have some cooked rice noodles. And to that, we're gonna add some pea pods, a little green onion, some shiitake, a little bit of chopped cilantro, and that beautiful venison loin that Kaylee seasoned up. So just lay some of that meat on there. And then we're gonna take that Asian broth and go right over the top of that meat. I'm gonna take that meat, just get it into the broth and get it cooking, just like that. 
and it doesn't take long for this meat to cook. We'll take a little, a few pea shoots, a little squeeze of lime, and to make it a little special, a little chili. Let's give this a try. Mmm. Ooh, we got a man overboard here. What do you think of the soup, Kaylee? We've taken the soup as far as it can go. <laughs> bon appetit. We hope you enjoyed this episode of New Hampshire's Wild Side. Be sure to check back for new content at nhwildside.com. I'm Mark Beauchene. And I'm Christina Lupi. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. To learn more about life outdoors and New Hampshire fishing game, check out some of these videos. And be sure to subscribe.